And we're back with another episode of NX Office Hours, where we answer all your questions about NX. And we talk about NX Cloud. We talk about all things NX here. Uh, if you've seen my face before, Brandon, Brandon T. Roberts on Twitter. Uh, got a first time, first time, uh, I don't want to call you a guest, uh, first time co-host. Let's call it co-host. Nice. Uh, I like that. Yeah. Zach, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, y'all. I'm Zach. I'm a senior engineer at Narwhal right now. And I um, also stream a little bit. So catch me okay. on there. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead and get your get your plug in right off, right off the top <laughs> here so we can. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I, I don't know. I tweet, I, I've been streaming on Twitch for an hour a day. I've been showing off some NX workspace stuff. So if you've got some more, if you ever want to come hang out with that, feel free to come join me on that. We're doing a little social media uh, thing. So mainly for learning. So, but, but we come across some interesting NX workspace stuff. Uh, probably most of you already know it, but like we're going through every day, we kind of pull up the depth graph and plot out this is what we want to do and stuff like that. So just taking advantage of the tools NX gives you. So very cool. Is your I'm going to put the link up here, but I don't want to get it wrong. Is your Twitch handle the same as your Twitter handle? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna show it up on the screen here. We can correct it if I'm wrong. Twitch.tv slash Zach DeRose, is that right? I could make sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. We'll just fix it. We'll just fix That's it in correct. practice. Slash. It's correct. Okay, cool. <laughs> Twitch.tv slash Zach DeRose. He's doing streams on NX dev tools and all the depth graph and everything else. So be sure to Check that out. I've watched a couple of them, and I I enjoyed I enjoy the banter. Uh, <laughs> I must say, well, I, it's always best when the, you ha you have a chat and you got some people to talk to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, you mean like just talking out into the void? Isn't <laughs> it's very odd. It's very odd because I, I very much want to have them. So, like, I, I'm posting them on YouTube. If someone came back and listened, mm -hmm. it's very odd. But it's very odd to like talk to talk to people as if they're there when they're not. <laughs> Like uh, uh, to a level beyond just being alone in my office talking to the camera, you know. At least yeah. sometimes, so if you have some chat coming through too, there's uh, yeah. that makes it a little bit easier. I definitely agree. The chat, the chat helps. Yeah, especially <laughs> if you're there to make jokes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the delay is a little rough too. Like you 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 send out a joke and you see if people laugh. <laughs> Any LOLs in chat? Then it's like, just waiting for them. Depending on what how slow or quick it is, you may get it 15 seconds, you may get it 30 seconds later. Uh, so yeah, that is definitely a, an adjustment to interacting with people face to face. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, let's like I said, we have a few questions here, and then if you have any questions uh, in the chat room, feel free to post them there. Uh, I'll also be checking the hashtag on Twitter. Uh, which is, I'll bring it up here, uh, hashtag NXQA uh, to check that out also. Uh, there you go. You got a point. <laughs> <laughs> you can't reach. The quite. mirror's got me all messed up, man. You can't reach <laughs> quite over far enough to get to it, but uh, <laughs> I think they, I think they'll, they'll see it. So, okay. So let's. Uh, I guess we'll get into some of these ones, not, I guess not in any particular order here. Um, and we've got some, like I said, gotten some of these from Twitter, some from Slack, uh, our community Slack channel. Uh, if you haven't gone there, you can get there from our uh, readme on the GitHub, uh, NX GitHub repo. Uh, but this question, first question is... Is it possible to use NPM instead of Yarn under the hood in an NX workspace? And I am going to say this most likely applies to Angular CLI projects uh, where you have a little more control over uh, the, com the configuration. Uh, you, if, you, if you have Angular CLI installed globally, uh, then you can control some of that configuration there using uh, global commands that uh, with the Angular CLI, and I think out of the, I'm not sure which one it uses out of the box for um, 
which one it uses, which one the actual Angular CLI uses out of the box. But NX actually just defaults to Yarn uh, out of the box, but you do have some control over if you're using the Angular CLI to set that property. So what you want to do is I'll bring up the command here is you use the config command if you have the Angular CLI installed globally. Use NX config. You use the dash G, which is just a shortcut for global slash dash dash global, and then you set the CLI package manager to npm. Um, so that way, if when you create, if you set that before you create your new workspace uh, with NX, then it will use npm to install your dependencies, and of course, you get a package lock.json file instead of a uh, yarn.lock file, and you can don't have to do any extra work there to remove one and add the other, so. Yeah, Brad, I was just looking because, um, you know, for my, for the for the live stream, it created mm -hmm. the package lock.json when I ran uh, create NX workspace. So I wonder if NPM okay. is used by default now. I'm actually not sure. That's what I, I can't, couldn't figure out just now, but. I remember there was a time where it was actually like one of the it was one of the questions the CLI would ask you. Mm -hmm. um, you mean with with the NX workspace or the Angular? Yeah, CLI? so so when you run like npx create NX workspace. Oh right, um, right, right. It asks you some questions. I'm running that right now with like a test thing to see. Um, okay, so. and you don't you don't have the CLI installed globally. Uh, no, I was just using MPX create NX workspace. So, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I have. It may may have changed. Uh, like I said, it was a question X on Slack, and we can double check to see if something's different there now. Just because we did release, have a major release here recently, uh, which shouldn't have impacted anything, but but we can yeah. check that either way. So yeah. Uh, like I said, if, if you're one to flip one way or the other, you're using uh, change your package manager to yarn or back to NPM, that command is what you would use to do that. Okay. Our next question is, uh, what do you recommend to share code? There real quick. What do you recommend to share code between Angular and React apps? I know we have uh, some example. I believe we have some examples of this uh, within our uh, NX examples repo. But uh, have you done? Do you have any comments here about how you share? I guess this could apply for multiple Angular apps or different React apps. Like, how in general do you share? share code between apps. Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I don't touch React that much. Uh, it's just uh, kind of the path my career has taken me. <laughs> but um, like uh, for, for Angular apps, um, like the uh, creating the, the, the libraries um, using the, the NX workspace uh, schematics kind of sets you up really nice for creating these nice modules for you know pieces of Angular code. And um, I've actually been in some repos where we've actually taken those modules and made them specifically generic so we could reuse them in some other mm -hmm. Angular apps. Of course, this is all in Angular world, so I think that's a bit different from what the question's really asking. I think well, you no, probably... Think we, can, um, we, can, we can scope it down to just sharing between Angular apps because I think the same rules... I think the same rules still apply in general mm. as far as like what we're... The, thing, the type of things we would share between... Uh, applications in general, like uh, interfaces, models, those kind of things, maybe some utility functions. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite things about NX, like the thing that got me really excited about it first off was being able to say, hey, well, I, I was working on this side project at the time. I had this one repo for my server and mm -hmm. this other repo for my, for my uh, Angular client. And it was like keeping those two things in sync. <laughs> like it would have to be like I, you you would change I would change something like to to like a TypeScript in, interface. I need to make sure like every time I submitted something that uh, 
those things matched up. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to bring in NX and write this, like just a, a TypeScript library at the bottom. Um, so just maybe that does answer this question, like it, getting just a regular TypeScript library where you can define your interfaces, define some basic utility uh, functions. Um, functions, I think, are best. <laughs> you don't need classes. You don't need dependency injection for a lot of our problems. We just need some functions and some interfaces, I think. Mm -hmm. So being able to do that, maybe you can define, you know, here, here's our customer model. This is what this is what every customer should look like. That should be the same across Angular and React, really. I think. And if, if there is something that's specific to Angular or React uh, or to App A or App B, that's. Uh, I think NX is really good in helping you construct your modules to what they truly should be, right? Because um, the, yeah, the whole the whole idea of a, a modular design is you like have a Lego block and you can build anything on top of that Lego block. Mm -hmm. if, if if when you're using it, you realize, well, I can't really use this like a Lego block. It's really so closely coupled to this other module. Like it, it kind of points that out to you. So maybe you can see, well, is this really the module I need, or do I need do I need something else? Or, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. You have to make you have to scope the responsibility of those things down if you want to reuse them across multiple places. That's why I mentioned like utility functions, like those should be things that aren't necessarily tied to React or tied to Angular. They could just be things that do like data transformation or uh, things mm -hmm. like something that you could easily, you know, consume within Angular or React. Um, or like say your interfaces; those are things that are aren't tied to either platform, uh, more or less think features of TypeScript that you want to share across uh, particular apps or even multiple libraries within a single app. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think using, like I said, using sharing code in that way is the is the most straightforward way. And like I said, NX, like you said, NX makes that pretty easy uh, to do. Uh, because of the tooling around it, where you can just generate libraries, uh, generate app, you generate applications, libraries, you can tie those things together pretty, pretty easily. For sure. And yeah, just being able to say, you know, we're, we're changing, we're, we're updating to the newer version of our, of our API so that we're going to touch this interface, just to being able to touch that interface at that lower level utility library. And then see, okay, your, your CI is going to catch that. You know, we, we broke something here. Yeah, that that is surprisingly hard to find if those if these things are spread across multiple repos. So, so what did you? So let's, let's talk some about what you. What did you end up doing? Like, how did you manage the the synchronization problems that you had with your <laughs> with your other, so, with your other project? Right, right. So this was this is a side project. So like. We didn't have like a really stringent CI CD. I was just like literally. I, I think we were using Firebase hosting, so I was just like published mm -hmm. to the the Angular app used Firebase hosting, and like the the API was on um, what's that thing that the droplets ocean digital uh, digital, digital ocean. ocean. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So um, it was just like <laughs> just make sure you hit the button at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of what it, what it came down to. Um, so, yeah, that's that's not a great way to manage stuff. <laughs> it, it yeah, and it, it was more just like um, to like uh, in the in the early stages is when it was the biggest headache because that's when a lot of these things are moving around a lot. So we're making changes to the API, making like fundamental changes, and forgetting <laughs> forgetting to add those into your front end part. So. Right. You and I'm guessing you were managing those in separate repos also, right? Cuz separate that, repos, that yeah. That was a thing to do. Yep, yep. Well, so um so this was before I knew what NX was. It may have been before NX was around, I'm not sure. But okay. so I was just using the Angular CLI and Angular CLI is decent, but it's really not set up to to handle um to handle multiple apps or to to uh, I don't know. They, they've done they've done some more stuff recently, uh, just mm -hmm. being able to modularize your code better. But like at the time, I remember I was just everything was in the app module. Like mm -hmm. there is there is no other ng modules. Um, my stuff was making. 
So <laughs> it was a different world. It was the wild single, west. The single NG module to rule them all. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, even even when we when we first moved, uh, when I first started into NX, it was like, okay, we're going to have everything in in the in these apps, and then when we see something shared, we'll push it down, mm -hmm. uh, like into a library into something shared, which which worked out uh, pretty well. But but getting into a, a space later on where it was very much like let's define modules at the start, and that's that's what that depth depth graph was so good at doing for us was mm -hmm. like visualizing that. So yeah, the, the depth graph definitely makes it uh, a lot easier to see where all your what all your stuff is <laughs> in, yeah. a, in a particular project even once you just start taking out small pieces at a time um to show like i said once you once you initially let's say you have an existing angular app and you start to migrate that to an nx workspace then you your dependency graph isn't going to be that big because you only have maybe one app and like an end-to-end -end app um but once you start breaking it down into smaller libraries and like you said, sharing, making those utility libraries to share, then you start to see you get a bigger picture of the things that you can share within your uh, within your workspace across apps or your API back end services or things like that. So For sure. definitely, definitely useful. Here, Brandon, do you want me to, can I share my screen here and show off this depth graph we have? Yeah, sure. Let's see if I can do this. Um, do on this. There, can you all see this depth graph here? Uh, not yet. Um, oh, Chrome has lost permission. Uh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think Streamyard is going to let me do it. I think I okay. got to like go into my privacy stuff to let it screen share to Chrome. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no problem. You could, we we can uh, we can wait a second while you do that. And James yeah, yeah. in the chat room, of course, says or migrate an enterprise React app and break the depth graph with so many nodes. <laughs> oh yeah. Very, very good, uh, Spivey. I see you out here breaking the depth graph, but that's okay because we're making it, we, we took that punch and we're making it better. So um, the, depth, the, the depth graph is definitely getting better because we're throwing more, more things at it. Yeah, so like I said, while he's bringing up the depth graph here, um, like I said, if you have any other questions comments about nx okay they put in a pr to fix it so there you go prs are always welcome at uh pr is always welcome at narwhal and nx definitely accept those contributions for fixes or code or the code testing comment or uh, documentation all of it contribute to nx is what i would say so Zach is getting while Zach is getting his permissions together. Uh, we'll go ahead and plug the plug the NX docs here. Application window. There we go, and he's back. Hey, sorry, I had to quit to. <laughs> To be able to allow privacy settings. Hey, no problem. That's what we do here. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah, I know that you it probably had something to do with uh, um, Mac or something having a additional privacy settings. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to bring up, I'll go ahead and bring up the community page because I know we're going to look at that at some point. Um, but yeah, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, we can. Uh, you can show some examples there. Yeah, but, yeah. So I, I was just showing off the, uh, let's see, can y'all see the? Yeah, let me add it here. There you go. There you go. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So the, um, this, this was, this is just the depth for the, um, for the stuff I've been working on with the live stream. So another, uh -huh. another shameless plug for that. But you can <laughs> see we have, have like the, the API is this, uh, this over here. 
Yeah, if you can zoom, this, this over here. You can zoom yeah. in, zoom in a little bit, uh, so you can see. There you go. You might have to yeah. just move, zoom around some. Yeah, that that's yeah, better. That, that works. Cool. So like you'll see, we have like this this models file down here where like the interfaces are, and there's some like basic like pure functions in this. You mm -hmm. can see like the the different. These are our different front end um, modules that uh, where we're, so we just started getting into authentication over here, and um, we got the front end posts, and uh, this is a bunch of ngrx stuff in here, mm -hmm. and then. Um, and the back end. The back end you can see also looks at models for um, for being able to handle the different request handlers and stuff. So this way, like if we if we change the data contract between this back module here and this front end module here, you know they're they're both uh, both of these interfaces are being sourced by this one thing. And this this depth mm -hmm. graph I think is just so good at being able to visualize that stuff. Um, and yeah, so can you make a can you. I don't know if you can do this on the fly here, but just make a change really quick and then show make maybe change in the models uh, library. Uh, or are you I, just showing the uh, Yeah, I think in the one I have right here, like I don't I don't actually have any git commits right now. It's just there's okay. I have 160 <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> know, look, look at that, 160 uh, touch <laughs> So, so I can't really fire, show. My friend. I know I, I, am, I am. That this was my th what I'm actually sharing. This is like my snippets of, of oh, okay. like me working ahead, actually. So I, I didn't I didn't commit anything. But the I think what you're trying to show is like um, you can also show affected. So like if I made right. a change in one, we could see like the how the how different things were. I think like spotlighting one of these. Like if I wanted to spotlight the back end posts one, mm -hmm. I think I can just click this and it'll just like remove everything else from the depth graph. Yeah. That, this is kind of similar. Like it, with the affected stuff, you'll see the red line where you'll actually see the red lines going through and so and what got affected. This is the the spotlight at least is really helpful in terms of like narrowing down the uh the depth graph to see what what actually is affected by this one module. Mm -hmm. You can see that this way too. If anything's super tightly coupled, um, it's good to good to be able to see that too. So. Yeah, definitely. And I think that I, I, this is a great example because I think it leads right into a question that we get a lot: is how do I organize my code within an NX workspace? Mm. Uh, and I think this. I think each. Of course, every project is going to be different and then everybody has their own. Well, not everybody has their own opinions about it, but because uh, we have a book that like recommends, you know, grouping things in a certain way and naming things a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, but some project, like I said, it depends on the scale of the project, right? Oh, for so, sure. So how do you how did you go about, um, I guess, talk about how you went about organizing the the projects within your, within your, uh, the project that you're working on for the Twitch stream. Sure. So, um, I, I guess you can kind of see here. That, I mean, um, it's getting to the point where it's a little complicated, but uh -huh. we, we have, uh, so I, it's a social media platform. Uh, again, it's like, it's, it's barely anything right now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's literally a login thing and, uh, post your stuff. But um, the idea is like we we have these two discrete features right now the the auth and the our our ability to make posts. Mm -hmm. um, so the way I mean the way the the front end piece works, um, we're like those the the auth has some front end pieces we need for it like the login form, like um, it's got some ngrx uh, stuff I guess associated with it. So we want to see if someone's logged in. Who that user is, uh, you know. Eventually, like uh, as the project evolves, I imagine we'd probably had have another uh, module in here called like front end users, and the idea for that would be like um, your friends would kind of be in here. So any any time you had a friend, um, we'd have uh, something uh, something uh, UI UI com components there to see like when I'm looking at a friend's wall. Their mm -hmm. equivalent, um, 
you know, this is this is that friend. It maybe looks at the the different post information. So like we can see uh, post your friends made recently. Um, and it's uh, auth was probably interested in that piece a little bit too, because uh, you auth right, right now it's got like the art the user object for the person who's logged in. I imagine uh, down the road that might just be um, uh, this this probably would hold some extra size that's actually logged in. But I imagine we'd probably want to like uh, have some have it uh, use the users piece so that we could. Uh, like users would actually hold your own user information, the public pieces at least. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. It's actually interesting working with this with NGRX because I think it's almost like you don't need lines to to show some of those relationships, right? Like right. Um, you. So so for the users and the auth, the, the relationship between those two things. This kind of this front end public store. I don't I don't love the name of this, but the idea is this would hold the actions and the selectors. Mm -hmm. um, that that you would use to get uh, to to like uh, the different pieces of auth information or the different pieces of post information, and so these things actually like my auth stuff is actually dependent on some post things, but because I have this yeah, bottom which, level store, it just I just mm -hmm. point to that. So, so um, you know that it's kind of a bridge between the the front end auth and the uh, front end posts. Yeah, like I, I really think this this store down here kind of represents the store. Any public pieces of it, the the store mm -hmm. API. So any selectors, any actions. Um, the way I have this set up to Brandon, just so you know, that like the the posts um, module itself is going to have the post reducer and the post effects in it. Okay. Uh, same with auth. It's going to have some auth effects and some auth uh, reducer in it. Um, but the both the the actions and the selectors for both are down here in the public store, so that's not convention. <laughs> I know that's not what <laughs> we recommend in the book. I don't think that's. I think um, I think you would it, uh, you prefer to have things in their own NGRX module. Yeah, I I tend to put them. Well, I guess I caveat that with in an NX workspace you are more inclined to put them within a separate library uh, just mm. because it makes them easier to share. If you put the NGRX state, we'll call it NGRX state in with the feature, then it makes it a little more challenging if you want other features to be able to uh, make changes to that state, especially if those features could end up depending on each other. Right, so, right. So if like my posts are going to yeah. depend on auth in some way at some point in time because I want to make sure, you know, they're going to need to know that when users come in, I want to tie that user ID to mm -hmm. the user information. And I think if if the selectors are in with the user information, we have to draw draw a line directly between these two right. these two modules. Yep. So Yep. And I think that's something I've commonly seen within an NX workspace is uh, or maybe not, not just any sort of space, even if you use a regular Angular CLI project and, and you uh, create libraries in that work, separate libraries in that workspace and you put them in there, you're still going to run into that same kind of issue where if you don't move the store away from the feature in those particular cases, then it's going to it's going to make it easier to get into a circular dependency. And once you get in there, then it's, you're going to have more work to be able to try to un untangle it uh, to break up, break those things out of there. So starting at that point from a shared perspective just makes it easier in the, in the long run. Yeah. Those things. Brad, did, have you seen, have you seen dark on Netflix by any chance? No, I, I have not. Tell okay. me about it. It's it's this very interesting. Uh, it's a German series, actually. Ben actually, uh, Ben uh, from Narwhal uh, mm -hmm. mentioned it to me. That's what got me started to watch it. But it's about how you can make. It, it's about uh, knots in time. Is kind of the idea. Okay. Is that so? So they're going. Uh, these characters are going through. They they can jump back in back in time thirty three years or forward in time thirty three years. Huh. And but but when they when they do something back in time, it's going to it should change, but it doesn't because they're realizing 
them going back in time and doing something is already fixed. Like it already happened in their in their timeline. So mm -hmm. they're going through and creating this huge knot in time. It's un completely uh, uh, impossible to untangle. The whole the whole series is about them trying to figure out how to untangle it. It's very it's very good. Like I, it makes me want to watch more German stuff because it was really good storytelling. But um, that 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 idea of trying to untie the knot is something I felt I, I, I really resonated with me working with some. Okay, James, James on the, in the chat said spoil no spoilers. Oh yeah. shoot! Sorry, James. <laughs> I don't think I put any big spoiler there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I don't think I did. I'll definitely have to try and uh, watch that. Is it like a full series, a full season, or it's it's three seasons, and I think they're done. They're done now. I think there's okay. no fourth season. Like I think they wrapped everything. So so check it out. Uh, and Ben Ben had told me to make sure I I listen to it <laughs> with in the original German and just use the subtitles, but I did not do that. <laughs> I'm oh. too lazy. <laughs> So that means you really got you really got to focus if you got to turn the uh, I know you know, I know the German version with the subtitles on the the voice act it was surprisingly good mm -hmm. um, the, the English voice acting so uh, that's maybe that's another uh, plug ahead of our time but yeah, yeah. That, that that just the analogy of those like um, wanting to keep wanting to keep our dependencies discreet like that's a, a lot of times um i find when, when i get kind of dropped into an nx workspace I, I i pull up the death graph and look through stuff and sometimes it's just like huge um and, and you, there's not much you can get from it but it's i i really like um in 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 stand-ups at my previous company when i was kind of leading a little bit we'd always pull this up like this was this was how are we going to do things? Like we got a new feature. Where does it belong in the depth graph? Like that's the first question. Not not just like where does it happen to fall because of the different <laughs> imports we, we happen to use? Like how do, how do we get this? Where does it belong and how do we make that happen? So yes, I've said I've said this on the probably on the office hours before, but if you if you give develop if you don't give a developers a place to put things, they will just drop them anywhere. And even if you even if you do give them a place to put things, you have to make sure that they don't put too many things in there. Cause, <laughs> cause there's always like, Oh, there's a shared bucket. And there's a shared place. <laughs> <No>. that's, the, <laughs> that's the bucket where I will put everything. Right. <laughs> so you got it. You got it. I like, I like that idea though, that you use the, you use the depth graph as a, as like you use a depth graph as like a tool to make sure that you aren't, um, putting too many things in there or creating yeah. too many or that your dependencies are still remaining relatively thin. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a great map, especially, especially at a scale like this, you, you get to bigger, um, bigger projects and it's much harder to trace all those things around. Like, like the, the, um, it, in, in some projects, it's just the, the depth graphs gets huge, but being well, able to like, uh, I get like a missing image thing right now, but usually this is like a crosshair thing. Being able to crosshair like a specific uh, library yeah. that kind of gets things more manageable or hopefully gets things more manageable. If it's not manageable, that may be like a sign of a smell in itself, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, or like, yeah, you know, like, or like I said, if you, if you easily run into a circular dependency, then mm -hmm. that's probably a good, uh, a good, indicator that you might want to move some uh move some things around and create smaller libraries out of those yeah yeah i think so and yeah just just recognizing this would be like directional acyclical so no no circular dependencies <laughs> uh graph uh that's 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 a big point you don't want any knots in here um, mm -hmm. you, you don't want to, I, I would, I would even argue like if, if you can target something and you've got weird, like going back and forth, I don't know if you, if you've got something that resembles a knot, then maybe it may be time to think. What about spaghetti? Uh, can it resemble? <laughs> no. uh, it definitely can, <laughs> but I, I don't know. Um, a lot of this comes to like these, these architecture I think like architecture discussions, that's hard to have 
hard mm-hmm. to have in like in 30 minutes or <laughs> you yeah. know it's like it's like a whole thing of stuff you need to, to know and understand so but but using this as a nice tool i think can be super helpful for for teams that are using nx uh some people may not even be aware it's a thing like i don't i don't know if we do enough marketing around like pushing the depth graph being this cool thing mm-hmm. it may be because just as time goes on it becomes harder and harder to for it to be useful but the the changes that philip made recently so you can like target stuff i think is really good for that so yeah i know that the least were for we think we're doing more uh, for the dependency graph to make it, you know, e- quicker to render in large projects, mm. James, uh, <laughs> and more filtering and just more, just making it easier to manage on large projects because that's eventually where you're gonna, eventually where you're gonna end up uh, if you have a large project that you need to, you wanna, you wanna take advantage of the the depth graph uh, there. So as far as like the the folder like the folder structure in your within your project, or do you have I guess how many levels do you have? Like, are you just keeping sure. a front end and an API, or how are you like constructing your folders? Yeah, so I I have my apps up here. Uh, I don't know if you let me make that a little bit bigger. There you go. Yeah, it's better. Uh, in the apps, the the R circle is is the web client right here, mm-hmm. and then here's the API. The ETE, I actually haven't touched this yet, either in the stream or in my snippets uh, that we're looking at. But I think the idea would be that um, in this, I was working on some builders to run the um, the client and then launch the API and then like seed the database and stuff like that. Okay. So the idea would be ETE would be actually be a proper ETE. So in, in the depth graph now, I think it's, uh, if we select all, it kind, of, it kind of only depends on the web client here. Mm-hmm. Uh, ideally, I'd like for it to kind of be both. <laughs> so, so we could see, okay, if something changes in the API, we still actually need to run our end-to-end tests because the end-to-end test is like truly end-to-end. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, okay, so, so what you... What you would, I guess, what you could alternatively do is, I guess, there's two par- two parts that jumped out to me. One was, mm-hmm. um, you said you had a, you were writing something that you could r- start up the app and the API together. Or are you using? What are you doing? What are you using there? I'm, I'm going to assume you're using run commands. I'm not API. actually. I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I wrote, I wrote a custom builder. Um, okay, even this. better. So here in my builders, I, I actually have some documentation on this that I'm, I'm still trying to uh, clean up so we can get it into the the NX. Uh, uh, the repo uh, documentation? Yeah, yeah, the, our, our documentation I get, stuff. I got you. But the, uh, the idea here is, I don't, I don't know, this will just look like uh, ramblings of a madman. <laughs> But well, the idea, <laughs> just yeah. this, this, you can just keep it at a at a high level of what what you got going. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. This may be this right here may be a good good way of looking at it. Like the idea is, we're going to concat uh, a process uh, making Mongo. Mm-hmm. So so th- this that in this would kind of like create a child progress to to run a Mongo D. Uh, process that's kind of going to start up Mongo, and would then go in and like seed some some basic information, and then we're going to uh, run this target so the R Circle API serve, mm-hmm. and then we're going to run the serve itself. So this is for the web client. So the idea is start up Mongo, start up API, start up web client, and then once all those three things are done, we're going to initialize Cypress. Right there. Okay, um, I see. That makes sense. So I, you could probably use the rug commands for this. <laughs> like you probably could. Yeah. You probably just do the same thing. Um, but, but I was trying to be fancy. You learn it. Yeah, you would. You maybe you would. You would use run commands before, so I can see you yeah, trying, yeah. trying to challenge uh, to see how much you could do with builders. Because like you said, you were writing up some docs on that, and I think it helps to build something with that and see if you can refine the doc so that you can. You know, point somebody else in that direction too. 
yeah, yeah, that's that's the goal here. So this is this is not finished, so don't, don't, look at this, don't take this too seriously. But look away. Yeah, look away. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that'll be on nx.dev soon though. So Okay. Cool. But yeah, uh, let's actually let's let's bring that back up. Where did that go? Um so because we were the, the initial question was about the library structure, actually, right? So yeah. Uh, well, I have yeah, two parts, the library structure, and then the other, you answered the one about how you can run the, you can run uh, projects using run commands, but if you need something else, then you can write your own builder to kind of orchestrate those things too. Right, right. The the run command, so so just, just to explain what that is in case someone doesn't know, it's just a way of like running a series of commands. I think they, they all run in parallel. Think. Yeah, I think they run in parallel by default. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so the um, what I have on screen here that's actually trying to do something different, where it's it's sequenced. You do one and then the other and then the other, which is it's kind of needed because like the API needs to be up and running for, in order for the proxy to work correctly. Mm -hmm. Usually, you can just use run commands, and your API tends to serve up quicker just because it's not doing the whole Angular compiling stuff. So. Yeah. Um, but but this is this is kind of trying to get rid of that race condition, um, so yeah. But 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 the way my the way the libs are structured, I just have the backend grouping so that I have the auth Mongo client and post here and in, inside my backend folder, and then in front end I have a similar thing going on, so mm -hmm. that there's each one of my front end modules, and then um, this this is kind of like the shared one we had talked about, so it's just got oh, yes. our the bucket, no. The bucket, yeah. <laughs> this is pretty much what it is, and like you could have several buckets at the bottom. Like I was considering, like um, you'll you'll see inside of here, I have one file for, and this is for like the the posts, mm -hmm. and then we have a file for like users. Um, I was considering, like, should these should this itself just be a a, a library? And it kind of could. <laughs> It's just, yeah. it's just like you, you get to a point at some point where you get some diminishing returns from that. So that's that's kind of why for now, at least I have the one bucket. Where I'm mm -hmm. just putting all my interfaces. If it came, if it got to a point where I really like, uh, it, it, there's more stuff in here. Maybe <laughs> maybe at some point I'd I'd separate them out. But yeah, I'm trying to um, bring up. I know we have a doc in here mm -hmm. where we talk about. Uh, creating libraries and trying to find it here. Yeah, well, so uh, let me show while you're doing that. I'm using like the the plugin right now. So I'm going to make like a Angular lib. Mm -hmm. uh, this directory here, like this, this is how I'm doing that nesting. Like I'm not going through and actually like moving files around. I'm just saying this will go under the front end directory via the, uh, well, the CLI, I guess here, since I'm using the, Console plugin. It's really to this form, and then oh. if I put some test name here, uh, this would run, and we'd be able to see. Here's the dry run of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Quick plug for NX console there, where you can. Uh... It's so nice. It's so nice to not have to remember all these arguments and what they're <laughs> going to be. Like, you don't, I'll, I'll, you, don't like I, you don't like typing anything on the command line. I, I actually, I actually do sometimes because it's nice to just press up and like remember what you did. But mm -hmm. I will still use the console just to get this line and copy it, you know, <laughs> like yeah, uh, that's that's just just to make it so I don't have to remember. Is this dash dash dir? Is it dash <laughs> dash d? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, yes. Yes, I agree. Because <laughs> I so. type, especially like when you're if you're doing like say doing live streaming or things like that, and you're trying to generate. It's hard. It's hard enough like trying to type things out on the fly. And of course you, you when you're in the moment, you you can't remember what the actual the specific commands were is like if you were just typing it on your own off screen. So yeah. Kind of NX console helps you uh, at least gives you a UI to so you don't trip over your own <laughs> trip over your own feet when you're when you're streaming. So for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I was bring up this um Doc here we have on we have actually have a set of docs for uh, the NX workspace structure. Um, uh, shout out to Isaac 
on the NX team who has worked on, well, Isaac and you and others who have worked on these docs uh, for the structure of an NX workspace. How should you, like I said, has questions here on questions and answers. Should you make libraries? Should you add to existing libraries? I think we talked about that. Whether you want to, like I said, how grant, like that example you had with, should I put this, should I move this small chunk of code into a separate user library in case I want to make it like as small and reusable as possible? Uh, it has some things in there. Or is that just too much of a headache for this? small of a piece of code. So it gives you some guidance there that you can uh, kind of lean on when making those decisions about creating new libraries to be more granular or um, or adding to an existing library. Because you, like I said, you can you can uh, you can get yourself into a bind uh, just in general by adding too many things to a library. But at least it's pretty straightforward to move those things out of there. Yeah. I think we've got some questions here. Um, okay. Yeah, let's see. This last one here is the depth graph is super beautiful. Hey, thanks. And congrats to Philip because he. <laughs> Philip did it all, man. <laughs> <We're> just <laughs> taking it. For, uh, another shout out to Philip for making some huge changes to the depth graph have modules referencing environment variables in the app causing circular dependencies. The app runs okay. Any guidelines for referencing envir environment variables? You wanna I, I've got my opinions on this, Brandon. I can I can give them and you can tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay, go for it. <laughs> okay, for, for server-side stuff, you want to be using uh, .env, I think, and you mm -hmm. want to be making sure that your .env file is not in your repo. So, like, you're you're able to... Um, that, 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 that helps, too, for, like, having your, having your server-side uh, secrets be secret. So... Uh, like having having it not in GitHub in case you know someone who's a contributor on your on your thing if they if they get compromised you know all your secrets can go out that's it's important not to not have that in for that reason um, for for your front end stuff uh, oh Philip hey Philip <laughs> hey, yeah I saw I saw him in the in the in the chat there <laughs> he must have heard us giving him all the shout outs and had to hop in so. Yeah, Thank yeah. You, Philip, for all the dependency graph updates. Thanks, Philip. Um, for, so for front end config, I think we we do this in a lot of our in our Narwhal stuff, where we'll like do something inside uh, before building. It's like similar to to like the server side rendering, where we'll actually like um, at at build time we'll we'll put stuff into the index head. Mm -hmm. um, that that seems to work pretty well. Um, uh, you, if you're using Angular, you got to kind of do this weird dance with like dependency injection tokens to get that stuff right, and have your interfaces set up. So I, I think you pretty much like if you wanted really good type safety on your .env stuff too on the server side, it's helpful to have those those interfaces defined too. So even if you don't have what the actual secrets are, having some interfaces. Uh, define that'll say, or, or a type define that says this is what my my dot env looks like, and be helpful for you know at least knowing what the the shape of what that config looks like, if not what the actual config itself is in your code. Um, so I I think that's kind of my spiel on that, Brandon. I'm curious what your opinions on what I said. No, I I agree, and definitely on the on the server side things, you want to use dot uh, env files. Um, within your particular projects to kind of separate out those separate out those different configurations, and we have support for using those within an, an NX workspace. Anyway, uh, so yeah, use .env files. Um, don't check the don't check them into source control, uh, the ones that you don't want to get leaked out with your. Because uh, I'm I'm gonna or I'm saying you would distribute different ones, you know, based on your environment. So. Those things would be set up somewhere else, uh, but on you know, front end code, I think we've done this a couple of times. But uh, I know we use we use libraries. Uh, there's I guess a couple of ways using libraries to that get swapped out at build time, like you said, 
And even within the Angular CLI, using something like file replacements, uh, if you have some configuration that that's pointing to a particular file that you want to be different between environments, I mean, you can use that file replacement flag there <clears throat> and set up, you know, different configurations mm -hmm. uh, to be able to replace those files based on that configuration. So I think those are, uh, like I said, pretty pretty standard ways to do that. Yeah, so yeah, that was a, like I said, it was a good uh, good question about um, and using environment variables and preventing those circular dependencies because those are those are the things that will will trip you up um, mm -hmm. once you get into building your project. Like I said, if you haven't sometimes if you haven't split out your libraries to be small enough, or you have them tucked, you have some things tucked within a feature, and then you need to reference them across other features and then you can somehow like transitively get into a circular dependency which those are not not fun at all to yeah yeah <laughs> not fun uh, to entangle yeah like uh, going back to like the depth graph like um if, if you're going to use interfaces if you're going to use types and stuff like that i always like to have them like this concept of a bottom layer just mm -hmm. because like that's that's your lowest building block we def we program to our interfaces so we don't want to have that interface being like somewhere in the middle of the graph because mm -hmm. then if something ever needs to depend on that later on you have to finagle things so that it can be above that to be able to depend on it so yeah. it's uh, that's why i automatically try to push anything that can be stripped out as typescript only to like a bottom layer uh type thing so yep, definitely all right i didn't see i want to check the there's a question from uh, nick here we had another one okay yeah it, it was from the youtube um do you see it there brandon yeah is it this one yeah yeah that's it um what's the recipe in getting started to migrating to nx from multiple repos without being behind on say for instance a master branch this is, I feel like this one's tricky because it's just migrating from something that's not NX to something that is mm -hmm. like either, either you're looking at like the monster PR to get everything in there <laughs> at <Yeah>. one time, <laughs> which no one wants to do. But if, if you're wanting to do like one at a time, I think that's kind of what the question's getting at. Like you, you can still, so there's, there's, there's stuff with um, like linking repos that you can do like, um, uh, via npm you can like uh there's the linking functionality which mm. i i honestly don't know that much about because i always use nx it's kind of like nx is a is a trade-off for that but i understand it works pretty well i think you could maybe do something where you had linking set up between your nx workspace and your other individual repos so you could kind of mm -hmm. like set up if you need to do this and this is like a long running thing you, you could have it where you have your NX repo and you have the uh, NPM links to the other uh, libraries or projects as you bring them in. And as you bring them in to the actual repo, you can kind of remove those links one at a time. Yeah. I, I don't know. I've never done that. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually a lot harder than I'm making it sound right now, but I think that's probably the, the direction I'd look to go with that, Nick, if you're, if you're still listening. So. Yeah, I think there's, yeah, I, I agree. There's definitely a couple of a, approaches like linking or um, the other, like say you have the big bang approach to where you try to copy everything in at once. Uh, the, in, the incremental one, inter, incremental approach, I think uh, as long as you don't have too much, I, I guess it depends on your level of custom setup in there. Um, but the if you can drop in your code and I think, well, just to take a step back, I think what he's referencing is like you have your master branch, right? And your master branch is moving along and then you try to migrate to an NX workspace and then your your NX workspace branch is there at as of a certain point in time. Your master branch is still moving along. And then how do you keep your. How do you move your how do you bring your nx workspace branch like up to date and try to do that song and dance there um i would say that there then and we're working on this within uh at least within the context of an angular cli workspace 
to where you can introduce NX uh, without modifying your existing structure. Uh, so you can bring in like the minimal amount of pieces you need for the NX workspace and then kind of incrementally, you know, start breaking things out into apps and library or different apps and different libraries. Uh, so that might help some there. Uh, but like I said, you still have to do that song and dance to where uh, you basically going to have to rebase. I think that would be the easiest approach to where if you bring in like the minimum set of files like the NXJSON and uh, the NXCLI and have those things set up and have your projects in there, then it'll be easier to get your workspace uh, set up to be able to start moving things over. Um, Cause some things like if you have two or three apps uh, moving those over in one go is going to be a lot, especially if like you're, you're in development of those things currently. So I would take them as like move one in, make sure all your, you know, TS config references are right or your path mappings are correct. See if you can build, serve and lint it and then, you know, you start with bringing your second project in because the first one usually always the more the more difficult of the of the ones that when you're just starting to bring it in uh, to try to import it into that structure. So and we like I said, we used we still have this today where you can move your NX will attempt to move your files around into the structure of an NX workspace, but also will have the option there of just leaving your layout as is. So just a way, a couple of ways you can go about it. But yeah, you do, I would say move them, try to move them in incrementally. If you're, like say, if your TypeScript configuration isn't uh, too, isn't too heavy, but because you can bring, like I said, the NX CLI translates to all the, or, you know, defers to all the Angular CLI commands when it's, uh, when you're using it within that particular type of workspace. Uh, so yeah, it was a good, good question though. Um, I think we are right at time for, uh, right at our time. Yeah, Nicholas said he he likes that approach of with a minimal setup and then moving over to NX style incrementally. Great. So if, yeah, Nicholas, if you uh, are going down that path and you have an issue or something that could be better about that approach, just let us know on GitHub or even reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, let's get time to get these plugs in. Zach, you already had a plug at the beginning. I'm gonna bring up the NX community page here just so we can share with all the things that we are doing with NX. Um, so I'll go through that. You can visit our GitHub page. Um, all, all these links here are on the nx.dev slash nx-community page. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, we have a community Slack channel. Anybody can join. Uh, we do office hours every other, every second Monday at this time. So if you have questions that we didn't answer today, uh, feel free to ask those or uh, whether those be in our uh, Slack channel or on Twitter. Uh, follow NX DevTools on Twitter. I'm going to throw up that Twitter hash, Twitter uh, sign Twitter name there, NX Dev Tools. Uh, subscribe to the newsletter so you can get email updates or for when we go live again. Uh, what else? Well, I got all the things to plug. NX Cloud, free for open source projects. Uh, you get a free tier, even if it's not an open source project, you get a free tier of hours each month. So check that out. Setup is super simple. Uh, and if you want to create an NX plugin, we have a guide for creating NX plugins, you can see we have a directory, a growing directory, actually. Man, got too much scrolling. Dang, <laughs> a yeah, couple tunnels growing. scrolling through all these, Brandon. <laughs> growing directory of uh, community plugins. Uh, I just saw one recently where somebody added support review projects. Uh, so that should be fun. Hint, hint Wes Grimes, <laughs> you, NX. There you go. Oh, oh Wes. <laughs> you left a Wes shaped hole in my heart. <laughs> all right. Um, so yeah, well, those are that's all the plugs I got. I'm gonna bring up your Twitch stream here one more time so that people can see it. Thanks, man. Uh, so definitely check uh, Zach out. Come hang out in the chat room. 
And uh, we'll see y'all next time on NX Office Hours. See ya. See y'all.